Conspiring against Qatar, leaked emails from the UAE ambassador to the US show a sustained campaign against Qatar and Kuwait. A far-right pro-Israeli think tank is also linked. So how will this impact US policy in the Gulf? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahlbarra. It's been a week of tension in the Arabian Gulf. Last week, Qatar's official news agency was hacked. Then, fake remarks critical of US foreign policy were posted on its website and wrongly attributed to Qatar's leader. Now, a series of emails belonging to the UAE's ambassador to the US have been leaked. They reveal a close coordination between the diplomat and a pro Israeli think tank in Washington. The emails also show how Ambassador Yusuf al Atayba and the Foundation for Defense of Democracies lobbied in the U.S. against Qatar and Kuwait. We'll get to our guests in a moment. But first, Patty Kulhain has this report from Washington. You wouldn't think the ambassador who works out of the United Arab Emirates Embassy in Washington and a far-right pro-Israeli think tank housed in this nondescript D.C. building would have much in common. But thanks to newly hacked emails, we know they were working closely together to undermine Qatar and Kuwait in the eyes of U.S. officials. Zaid Jelani broke the story. Uh, as far as the contents of the emails, I think a lot of what they show is that there's a very intense level of cooperation between the Emirates government and sort of right-wing neoconservative think tanks uh, close to the Trump administration and close to the Israeli government. In addition to revealing plans to discredit Qatar, the emails highlight past and upcoming attempts to embarrass the country. Former Defense Secretary Robert Gates headlines an event in Washington, D.C., where he raises the idea of moving the U.S. military base from Qatar to the Emirates. In an email exchange with the Emirati ambassador, he's asked to, quote, give them hell. A few hours later, Qatar's official news agency was hacked, and false stories about the country's ruler supporting Iran and Israel were broadcast by Emirati-based channels. The emails highlight an agenda for a conference hosted by the Emirati government and the Washington-based lobbyist firm, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Qatar, the Muslim Brotherhood, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia are among the items up for discussion at the June 11th meeting. Other emails show a concerted effort to get negative stories about Qatar planted in the U.S. media. And one email from 2013 shows Ambassador Yusuf al Taiba also lobbied top Republican leaders in the U.S., hoping they would support the coup that ousted Mohamed Morsi in Egypt. The federal law stipulates that people who engage in any lobbying effort uh, that, uh, uh, that includes payment of money, when, when money changes hands, then all of these statements should be made public. And if you look up the open source, you will see that in the year 2014, the UAE was the top uh, 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 payer of, of money with $14 million. Officials at the UAE embassy in Washington and the FDD refused our request for comment on this story, which lays bare a secret campaign to discredit Qatar and others in the eyes of the Trump administration. The UAE and Qatar disagree on foreign policy in Palestine, Egypt, and many other places. It's now clear just how far the UAE is willing to go to try and make sure the United States sides with them. Patty Colhane, Al Jazeera, Washington. Let's bring in now our guests. Joining us here in Doha, Saad Jabbar, an international lawyer, in London, Ian Black, visiting senior fellow at the Middle East Center at London School of Economics. Ian is former Middle East editor for The Guardian newspaper. And on Skype from Washington, D.C., Mohammed Sharqawi, professor of conflict resolution at George Mason University. Welcome to you all. Let me start first by asking Mr. Saad Jabbar this. Mr. Saad, um, the content of the emails that were hacked does it suggest that this is a sustained anti qatar campaign, or do you think this is just a media war between two rivals vying for a bigger say in the region? No, it's a very, very serious campaign, which has not started in the United States. A few years ago, and Ian will tell you, that there was a similar campaign waged in London by a PR company working for the Emirates, 
and they, in order to do the same thing, to smear Qatar, its relationship with um, Hamas, its relationship with Muslim brothers, because and and also with the labor, the, the foreign workers in Qatar, all things which could really throw enough mud in an attempt or, or in the hope that it might stick. So what? When, once that effort or that campaign failed, because the PR company which was leading that on behalf of the Emiratis closed down. Now, I'm not, I wasn't surprised because it was to some extent well known that the Emiratis and those supporting them relied on certain think tank organizations, certain persons who are, have been discredited. If you look at the individuals, for instance, who have who have been leading the campaign on behalf of the Qataris, mainly they are new conservatives who have pushed and justified and encouraged the invasion of Iraq without any merit or without any hard evidence to justify that aggression on Iraq. Let me go to Mr. Ian Black. Mr. Black, you've heard what Saad Jabbar has just said. So what do you make of this whole uh, chapter now, which is, uh, uh, creating some mounting tension between the UAE and Qatar? Well, I think that what we have here is we have something that is visible publicly. We have uh, uh, leaks for, uh, to, intended clearly to discredit the two parties who are known. Let's, let's, uh, let's be clear. The Qatar and the United Arab Emirates uh, are on opposite sides of many arguments about the uh, contemporary Middle East. There's no question about that. So they've been targeted by leaks. It seems to me perfectly clear that the the uh, the hacking of the Qatari website um, was the first significant step in this, and we've just seen a significant act of retaliation. I don't think it's that difficult to try to decode that. So we have the media war of leaks, but slightly beneath the surface, less visible, certainly to the general public, are long-standing differences over significant policies. And, you know, both sides do this. Uh, I think that all governments want to get their point of view across. They want to uh, promote their own narrative. And when things are tense and difficult, mm -hmm. and they are tense and difficult right now, uh, they want to try to uh, to sp to besmirch, to blacken the reputation of the other. And I think that's exactly what is happening here. It's not that mysterious. It's quite dramatic because of these leaks, which inevitably attract a lot of attention in the, in the digital age. Everybody is tweeting like crazy mm -hmm. about what's going on. But the basis for the spat, the visible spat, is these long-standing differences over policy, and we, maybe we'll talk about this we a bit later, but they mm -hmm. have, there's been a change. There's been a change in that since the advent of President Trump and, you know, a shifting sense of what is likely to happen in the, uh, in the Gulf states. That's what this is about. I it's see your a, point. A, a propaganda war between two sides. Mohammed Salqawi in D.C., we're talking about the a top UAE diplomat in Washington, D.C., the man described as a diplomat with the best connections in D.C., uh, coordinating with a think tank, the FDD, and part of what they are doing, basically, is to frame Qatar in a certain way. Is this, is this something that could be seen as trying to steer the U.S. falling policy towards one specific direction? Uh, well, it seems to be a classic case of war of narratives and negative perceptions on both sides. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the diplomatic crisis in the Gulf has escalated into Washington as if Washington is the main field where they can settle their scores. And if we consider that there, has, there is a hacking of three year worth of emails of the Emirati ambassadors, with the aim of discrediting his uh, lobbying efforts and also the connection with an Israeli-affiliated foundation or institution, this triggers a lot of anxiety among the Gulf leaders because of what's go what goes on behind these constructed neg and narratives as if the Emiratis are siding with the Israelis or the uh, Qataris are supporting 
those suspected radical organizations like Hamas, like the Muslim Brotherhood. So unfortunately, this conflict could have been contained in the Gulf rather than following this new trend of you know, tit for tat. I and see. fortunately now, the diplomatic mission or the diplomatic maneuvering of the Emirates is uh, now part of the public sphere right. or the Let public... I, I see your point. Let me go to uh, Mr. Jabbar. Mr. Jabbar, you said this is a coordinated operation that has been going on for quite some time. But Qatar and UAE are part of the GCC. So ultimately, the general assumption is that these two countries could settle their differences within the framework of the GCC without having to sort of go to the US and settle scores. Uh, firstly, I completely don't agree with Ian and to some extent to uh, our friend um, in Washington, to have equated to, you know, to the two sides, Qatar and the Emiratis. The mm -hmm. Emiratis went firstly to Britain and then to the United States, trying to build up a case in order to demonize Qatar, preparing the, uh, the ground. In the Congress, there is now a draft law which is calling on criminalizing Qatar because of its relationship with Hamas, for instance. And that will... Um, uh, will, will, it will lead to Qatar being really treated like Iran before without the strength of Iran. In terms of financial sanctions, transport sanctions, they would have, if the attempt wins, it will, they will turn Qatar to a pariah like that of Gaddafi during, during his times. So the matter here is aimed at isolating Qatar, at showing it what it was not, and Qatar was not active in fabricating or spreading lies. When you look at each item and the way the institutions in America were chosen and the individuals who were chosen, the most extremists of pro-Israelis, like, for instance, Dennis Ross in, in, the, um, in, mm -hmm. in, in the, the Jewish Institute for uh, Security in America, the foundation, look at the people who, are, who they are, extreme extremists, new conservatives who have really led to the disaster in Iraq. And they disappeared, suddenly they emerged. And I would like to be shown where Qatar, for instance, were using fabrications. If you look at Saudi media or the Emirati media, read it all. They have created persons to say these are al Thani family, they are trying to uh, destabilize the, the regime. And a person who works for Uridu, he's known that he doesn't, he's not the same person as it was shown. And if you look at the fabrications, I study them for, for, for myself, and I say this, you know, objectively, I would like to be to, to see. Mm -hmm. So it, in appearances, yes, there are rivalries always between the Gulf states, mm -hmm. rival tribes, you know, there is nothing new about it. But when the aim is to show that Qatar shouldn't be, shouldn't be seen as an ally of the United States and the West, to show it as if it is Al-Qaeda, as if it is, you know, to some extent Iran, and the Gulf Council itself was created in order to protect the member states. And the referee, but in the fact, it, fails that it shows that the major it's partners in that cooperation council obvious. are plotting us and, 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 and in Gaza, Qatar, All right. and there is no other version to this. Let's take it issue by issue, and let me go now to Mr. Uh, uh, Black in uh, London. Mr. Black, now, we've seen the content of those emails. In some of those exchanges, the uh, UAE diplomat is asking the Americans to re consider or to consider relocating the U.S. base from, from Doha to, from Qatar to the UAE, for example, because Qatar is seen as promoting groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas. Is this something that could potentially have an impact on the U.S. foreign policy? Well, you know, first of all, uh, let me say that I think that the content of the, the leaked emails of uh, Ambassador Oteba are perfectly... Uh, Authentic. I don't think there's no. I haven't heard anybody claim that they're false. Mm -hmm. And I think myself, you know, looking at looking at the region and looking at the issues that are in contention, as Saad has just said, I think that they're perfectly uh, they're perfectly uh, accurate. I don't think they're fake. Um, and I think they give quite a quite a good insight into Emirati thinking. And I agree with uh, uh, Saad Jabbar that what the Emiratis are trying to do. There's no question about that. Will it have any effect on American policy is a more difficult question to answer. I think that the context that we need to understand this is that the Emiratis and the Saudis see in the
the Donald Trump administration, and particularly his policy towards Iran, as an opportunity to change things, to get their own way more in the region. Everybody remembers that both uh, and Riyadh and Abu Dhabi were extremely unhappy with President Obama uh, over the Arab Spring mm -hmm. in general, and specifically over his policy towards Iran and the nuclear deal of 2015. And what we see here is the Emiratis trying to seize the opportunity to, uh, to reverse that All because right. of the, the inclinations of the Trump administration in particular. That's what is happening, I think. Let, let me take that to Mohammed Salqawi, Mr. Salqawi. Do you believe the Emiratis, are, as Mr. Black uh, was saying, are basically trying to take advantage of the fact that there is a new man who takes over in the US with an aggressive narrative towards the, I, Iran, so, and potentially the, the Emiratis see him as a strong ally? Well, there seems to be uh, some implosion within the GCC because of this competitive game over the U.S. influence in the region. And I think now we have seen at least three major uh, Gulf states that are uh, competing and trying to sort of promote a different strategy in Washington vis-a-vis -vis Iran and vis-a-vis -vis the Arab states of the Gulf. However, I think it is not the right time to take such initiative because of how Trump is considering his foreign policy beyond the value uh, you know, uh, element, if you like. So I think it, we, this is not a huge conflict that, that is going to change uh, some of the U.S. foreign policy to, toward the whole Gulf vis-a-vis -vis Iran on one hand and the Arab states on the other. What should be clarified now is whether there is a serious effort now in the Gulf to contain this conflict, or it is going to be another uh, war that... of perceptions on, on airwaves. And I think it looks like probably if this momentum continues, the Gulf governments will not be able to contain, to contain this conflict the crisis. or okay. influence. I see your point. Mr. Jabbar, we're talking about a link between uh, the UAE ambassador in Washington and uh, the FDD, which is the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, uh, it describes itself on its website as a non-partisan policy institute focusing on foreign policy. Quite interesting that they were planning this forum in Abu Dhabi in the coming days, and uh, one of the themes in that forum was going to be Al Jazeera as a force of instability in the region. So you say you are non-partisan in a way, but then you're biased against uh, news outlets on, on the other hand. You know, if uh, Jack the Raper said he has never raped women, would you believe him? Because this is a blatant attempt, which is one of the most irresponsible attempts I've ever seen. Because now, remember what happened when Saddam Hussein was encouraged to attack Iran in 1980s? Look at the aftermath. That's where the tragedy started. I'm not saying that Saddam was a perfect uh, angel, but look at military options and where they would lead. And especially in the light, which is happening now in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, in Libya. So taking or trying to encourage Trump himself to adopt a military option against Iran. And, and for the Gulf, other Gulf states, the Emirates or the Saudis, they want Trump to adopt a military option vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And in this, they are identical to the thinking of Netanyahu. You know what will happen if um, Trump adopts that policy or that stance? Do you think that Iran, if it was attacked, it will attack uh, Pearl Harbor like the Japanese or New York? They will attack the Gulf states. So in for me, the GCC should have formulated a better policy and they should have waited because Trump is in trouble at home. And the man if in each move he has made is opposed within his own country from mm. the way he imposed a blank and collective punishment against Muslim states rather than follow, you know, the usual routine which is followed uh, as usual in all countries. If someone you don't mm -hmm. like him or you don't like them, just ban them or stop them or imprison them according to the law. Trump is not himself. He has no safe future. Look at what he has done with the environment. So each step has 
made or taken was wrong. So for this, um, the Emiratis are acting in the most irresponsible way to be confrontationalist vis-a-vis -vis their you know, neighbors, their brothers, and, and people who are fellow members of the same, and they are the same, you know, they are linked tribes anyway, okay. especially in the light of what is happening in the region. All right, let me now include Mr. Black. Mr. Black, you've extensively written on international affairs, and particularly this part of the world. Now, no doubt, no secret that countries have drifted apart following 2011, particularly this part of the world. Now, there is a new U.S. administration, but don't you think that the U.S. administration on its own will have ultimately to adapt to this situation on the ground, and therefore betting on this administration or that one seems a little bit premature at this particular moment? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think that the, the Saudis and the Emiratis are getting carried away. They're hoping to seize the moment of this new president with his clear views, with key personnel, uh, the defence secretary, the new head of the CIA, who are known to be hawks on the Iranian issue, and they're trying to push strategy in the direction that suits them. I mean, I think everybody got a very vivid reminder of that the other day, two weeks ago, I think now, at the Riyadh summit, mm -hmm. where Trump made, remember, his first foreign trip as president, and the focus on there was on attacking Iran. And he was attacking Iran and everything that it stood for at a time when the Iranian people had just had a presidential election. Well, how many presidential elections do we see in the Gulf region? I think everybody knows the answer to that. Uh, President Rouhani, who was re-elected and beat off a more hardline figure, has very much centred his policies on the implementation of the nuclear deal with Iran mm -hmm. that President Obama devoted so much attention to and which was so disliked by the Saudis, the Emiratis and, of course, by the Israelis. So my own view is that the, the larger Gulf states, the Saudis and the Emiratis, working very closely with them on this, uh, are getting carried away and they are certainly, it's a legitimate interpretation to say that they are mounting a campaign against okay. Qatar, whose positions after all on Iran and on the Palestinian question are well known. Mm -hmm. The novelty in all this is the timing and that's about the arrival of the Trump I see administration. Your point. Mr. Mohammed Salqawi, don't you think that the US should not really be bogged down into tiny issues and that ultimately it has to look into the most uh, challenging issues, particularly they're faced with uh, threats in the region, they're faced with the fight against ISIL, and that therefore that is supposed to be the main focus for the US administration rather than to be dragged into conflicts between uh, countries. Well, I think this goes well with the uh, promise of Trumpism, the isolationist approach and not meddling in other conflicts. So, as Trump kept saying that he wants to lead America but not the world, I think this is a clear message that the Gulf states in particular and the entire region of the Arab world is not really high on his agenda. So, unfortunately, the Gulf states used to be perceived as one political unit, either in Europe, either here in the U.S., they were, their lobbying mechanism was working well to, to a large extent. However, this new glitch between three Gulf capitals has introduced a new dilemma, whether we, the U.S. will continue its own foreign policy toward, toward the Gulf region as one approach, or this is maybe a time for the Trump administration to go into those details. And I don't think really that there is a serious consideration of these minor differences. At the end of the day, what matters here in the US is the Gulf money, the Gulf mm -hmm. investment. And now we have noticed that there is no longer I see any point. discussion mention of just uh, mm -hmm. or other, you know. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, we, uh, we, we have to leave it there because we're running out of time. Uh, Mohammed Salqawi, Saad Jabbar, and Ian Black, thank you very much indeed for your time.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hashim Ahlbara and the whole team here. Bye for now. Thank you.